So welcome everybody to Hayek Club Salzburg. Today it's the first time that we organize an event in English language. The today's topic is the prospects of international order that's based on chapter 15 of Hayek's classic, The Road to Serfdom. Therefore, we warmly welcome Georgiana Constantine Park. Uh, she's instructor at the subject and subject matter expert at Liberty University online programs. She has a PhD in political science. She studied European and international law and she writes for several international publications. Georgiana, great to have you here. Um, you're warmly welcome. Thank you very much. It's good to meet everybody. Um, I'm glad to see some faces as well. It's nice, especially during this pandemic craziness where everybody's isolated. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen over here so I can go directly into the presentation. So hopefully I remember how to do that. My screen is speaking to me in Romanian, which is interesting. All right, let's see. I'm going to share that, go in here. And OK. All right, so I guess I'll start with a short introduction of myself. Um, I was born in 1989 in the Socialist Republic of Romania. So I saw the uh, transition from communism to a form of capitalism and, and democratic society. Um, there was a lot to be seen there in terms of economics and in terms of politics. And it I really did pay attention even as a child to, um, especially because I got to travel in the West a little bit because my aunt actually lives in Austria. I was very lucky to go there. I would come back to Romania and I would see such immense differences. And I didn't really know what to attribute those differences to until I got much, much older and understood that I, we were all going through this transition. I grew up in Bucharest. Um, and, and as you said, I studied uh, Romanian, uh, European and international law there. I finally got my PhD um, in political science a few years ago. Um, that was very tumultuous journey and it was uh, a lot of hard work but uh, i very much enjoyed it and then i moved to the united states full time uh, but this only happened in about 2017. I, I had been going back and forth and visiting the united states since uh, about 2012 but uh, i only moved here when i got married which was 2017. so my connection to uh to hayek actually came around 2014, when I met Barbara Kolm um, at uh, FMRS in Romania, the Free Market Roadshow. I really do love that name. Um, and that's when I learned really about the, the Austrians and the um, Austrian economic way of thinking. And I, I thought it was uh, very interesting. And so I started really um, looking into that, collaborating with them. And uh, we're, we're still collaborating from time to time. And it's, uh, it's quite a joy to do that. Um, Right now, I obviously I live in the U.S. Uh, for the time being, especially with the pandemic, I, I used to go back and forth, but again, uh, I'm grounded, so to say, for a little bit. Um, I publish in several outlets around the world. Um, I wrote, I, I, and I actually can show you a few of them over here. So you definitely, you can find me with my name on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, I publish mostly i think in the market for ideas uh austrian economic center i did publish something with the economic standard these are really just just a few of them i think the big one though the austrian um the western australian jurist was where i published my um my thesis that actually connects to hayek's international order in 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 a very specific way because i looked at the united nations responsibility to protect and how efficient that particular international norm is. Spoiler alert, it's not. Um, in any case, right now, um, as I said, I write and I teach political science online for Liberty University here in the United States. Working online has been great, especially during the pandemic. Um, and I help some students with their PhD thesis, um, dissertations, I think they call them here. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, very fun and I very much enjoy my work. 
So enough about me. Uh, you have my email over there for um, any questions or uh, any ideas that you have or comments. Or if I mess up something, please feel free to write me and tell me you were wrong about this year or this book. Or That's not what this says. Just let me know because I definitely appreciate criticism. Uh, constructive, of course. So let's, uh, I guess, just a little introduction to the book. Um, most likely, most of you already know um, uh, almost everything there is to know about it. But um, let's just do this and keep the flow of logic and the presentation going, I suppose. Um, it began as a memo to the director of the London School of Economics, Sir William Beveridge. I really love that name. Um, apparently, uh, the London School of Economics, I recently found out, was actually um, um, founded by uh, uh, Fabians, which are a form of socialists. And uh, it was interesting to, uh, to find that out. But they didn't control the hiring, and so I think Hayek actually worked there for a while. In any case, he wrote this memo um, in order to um, dispute the then popular claim that fascism was the dying gasp of a capitalist failed society. Uh, he very much did not agree with this. This was in the early 1930s. I think it was published in 1944. Um, it was published for a British audience initially, uh, but then it was also published in the United States. And from what I've heard, uh, when Hayek actually got to the United States, he was expecting to speak to just uh, a few academics about his ideas. And he ended up uh, getting there and realizing that there's a full stadium of people waiting for him because there were a lot of, uh, of, of people here in the U.S. who felt very disenfranchised and felt that they were fighting a losing battle. Um, with, with the people on the left. And so when they got a hold of, of uh, this book of his, they thought this is, uh, this is a really great thing. And he became kind of an overnight celebrity. So that was an interesting little fact. Um, but this was definitely published during tumultuous times. I mean, it was the middle of, uh, of the war or well, almost at the end of the war, which things were getting worse and worse. And socialism was very um, popular in those times. And you know, hindsight, uh, as they say, is, is um, something that is just easy. You can look back and you can say, well, pff, socialism, of course, it doesn't work. But, you know, back then people were, you know, curious and uh, they were uh, not exactly sure where democracy, capitalism, all of these things, whether they were very stable. And so obviously questions, questions arose. Um, but I think he makes a very good point and a very good case for logic. Uh, where you don't really have to ask a lot of questions whether or not socialism works. There are some very logical points that you can just look at and understand that it really can't, not in the way that people want it to in any case. Um, so the book itself, which I absolutely love and I love rereading and looking at it again, I have it right here with me. Um, and I uh, sometimes talk to my students about him as well. Um, it revolves around uh, the idea of economic planning and uh, really how, uh, how doing this and uh, having planning and democracy and the rule of law uh, don't really go together. Um, and how economic control leads to totalitarianism uh, in one way or the other. And I really loved his question of uh, what is it really about? It is uh, who is planning whom? Who controls whom? Um, there are many, many important points that he makes in his book that I wouldn't just call relevant for today's society. I, I would call them extremely important. Because you see, I think he's a part of this very special group of people um, who just hit on very essential truths that will be um, true forever. You have uh, uh, thinkers such as Cicero and Plato and Aristotle. Uh, you have uh, more modern thinkers as well, as well who have just stumbled upon very um, important truths about human nature and what happens to people in certain situations. And um, to me, at least, it seems that human nature is, is, it can be unpredictable, but most of the times as you look throughout history, there are patterns that show up. And I think he stumbled upon these patterns. Um, one of the things he says, which I really like, and I took, I took a few quotes out of here because you can't uh, talk about this book without, without doing that, I don't think. Um, he says, democracy and socialism have nothing in common but one word, equality. 
But then he says, notice the difference. While democracy seeks equality and liberty, socialism seeks equality in restraint and servitude. And you don't really have to go too far, even nowadays, especially here in the United States that I've noticed, to see that it, this is this is true, but people don't are not they're not really able to see past the promises of socialism. So they talk about equality of income, they talk about the wealth gap, they talk about uh, all sorts of progressive taxations, and boy, do people feel it. Um, so again, you know, they don't make this difference between wishful thinking and what this actually delivers, not just what it promises. Uh, then he talks about something that I'm fascinated with in general, which is um, just language. So he talks about the changing the meaning of the word freedom, where you can see that it started by meaning freedom from coercion or arbitrary power or freedom from servitude. But now it can just mean freedom from necessity, freedom from want, freedom from restraints of the economic system, which all of this is very easily interpreted and taken by, by the socialists up and, and um, hailed as a wonderful thing, which of course it's not. Another thing he talks about, absolutely relevant to today, monopoly as a failure of capitalism. This has been touted, at least here in America, as such true, uh, such such a true statement that monopoly is in fact the failure of capitalism, which unless it were for the barriers to entry inside of the market that government put in place in the first place, that would not ever be the case. Monopoly wouldn't last too long because you would have other companies come in and they would want to make a profit and then you would have more choice for the consumer. Um, something else incredibly important that I found, especially for the COVID-19, um, pandemic period is the illusion of the specialist. Uh, we have been hearing this word uh, up and down in economics for a very long time, now in medicine and in all of these debates, this, this specialist, if you just give it to the specialist, if you just let the specialist plan, then everything will be okay because they know what they're doing. And I love what he says here. There could hardly be a more, um, unbearable and more irrational world than one in which the most eminent specialists in each field were allowed to proceed um, unchecked with their plans and ideals. So every specialist has their opinion. If you give one, and we can see this in Dr. Fauci in the United States, he was saying one thing in March of 2020, saying one thing in March of 2021, wear no mask, it makes no difference. Now it's wear two masks. Um, it, it would be irrational because things change. And when it comes to science, science changes. Every day you find out new things. That's the wonderful thing about it. But you can't make a religion out of it. Uh, he also touches on the concept of, uh, of abuse of, uh, of privilege, which again, he talks about uh, property as privilege over here, but we have so many issues with this idea of, oh, you're privileged, especially here in the United States, uh, where again, this is very relevant. And then he touches on something um, that I would love for people to understand that you can't really, you can't really see uh, at least um, the masses, I suppose, understanding this, which is that competition is blind. Well, what else is blind? He makes the point. Justice is blind, right? So isn't that the most fair way to look at things? If you're going to talk about the fairness of society, then only a system that is blind to who you are, blind to your color, blind to your interests, blind to everything except the effort you put into it. Only that can be a truly fair system. It also touches about anti-Semitism and, um, and anti-capitalism and how they go together. I have definitely seen this in the United States. A lot of my Jewish friends have been uh, complaining about uh, uh, so many things that, that come out that are anti-capitalist and somehow, some way, people manage to put some anti-Semitism in it. Um, and of course, he talks about the word liberty, again, touches on the word and how that has changed in his chapter, The End of Truth, which, again, is, is spot on. It's as if he's living here with us today. Um, and one more thing, and then I'll get to chapter 15, is when he talks about math as a victim of party lines. This is incredibly important because we're seeing a lot of things such as history, for instance, in the United States become 
so to say, victim of party lines. We're even seeing uh, books being considered, uh, whether you think they're banned or not is irrelevant, but if they're considered unworthy to be published because of the way that they present certain things, um, then that, that that is going to lead to a form of censorship if it hasn't already. So um, the Journal of Marxist-Leninist Natural Sciences, apparently he quotes, he says, we stand for party mathematics. We stand for the uh, purity of Marxist-Leninist theory in surgery. I would be very, <laughs> very worried about getting uh, operated on by a surgeon who stands for ideology rather than the reality of the human body. Um, and we definitely see this in the United States history and entertainment in the United States. Um, and also in Europe, there are a lot of things that are going on. And I can see this spilling out, spilling over into, into my country, uh, into Romania, which is really not ready. It's not ready for any of this, any of these conversations. So I think this road that he talks about, uh, whether or not we're on it today, I think the answer is yes, we are on it today. We've been on it for a very long time. So in terms of chapter 15, he argues for a no international uh, economic planning um, because they can only get the worst. Uh, for instance, you look at national uh, economic planning and you can see that it, it, some horrible things happen. You have shortages, you have all sorts of horrible things. And he says this is only going to be amplified um, on an international level which makes perfect sense and uh, is, is obvious to anybody who thinks about it. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit about the Great Reset, but I honestly think that that's a different conversation unto itself. Um, I have been looking, I, I've, re I've read the book, The Great Reset, I've looked through it. Uh, I've also looked at The Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab and uh, the reality of the matter is, um, that is a subject unto itself. I might just touch on this right at the end of this. Um, here is, I think, the idea that is the most basic one in the chapter. He said, any international economic authority, not subject to a superior political power, he adds, this is a different conversation again, even if strictly confined to a particular field, could easily exercise the most tyrannical and irresponsible power imaginable. I agree with most of that, uh, where we diverge paths. And I have noticed that he, in fact, does himself as well. He does kind of tend to go back and forth here because it seems that he does very much understand the conflict within human nature and the problems you would have with human nature for actually restraining people um, if you give them too much power. So he says, well, we, we cannot have an international economic um, planner, but we should have an international political one put there to restrain. Um, I don't see this as a possibility. I don't think, first of all, that you can divorce law from economics and, and politics, law, economics, these, all of these things go together. Um, and the definition of power and authority is something that, in fact, restrains. But I, it, 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 all of his book makes sense up until the fact the moment where he talks about uh, the idea of, of, of federation. And even though he means only defense and foreign policy, by the basic reality of how human nature is, once you give something power, it's not going to let it go. And it's going to want more of it. Um, and I think this is this is really obvious with the United Nations. That's why I was uh, touching on, on my thesis. You can You can see that it is a power at least the United Nations Security Council made to restrain and um, it is far, far from being efficient. Uh, you simply cannot have countries such as uh, Russia, France, China and the United States being in agreement um, in, in big important issues for their national interest. And unless there's force, uh, such a federation uh, wouldn't, wouldn't really make sense. But he does touch on that and he does say that there are countries for instance, um, in Europe, Western Europe would would be okay in a union, and I think that's where he's he's absolutely correct because unions need to arise from this organic, uh, natural, um, 
common ground of countries. And, and when they decide, you know what, we have so much in common, uh, we can work together on all of these things, then yes, absolutely, it makes sense. But then you add Eastern Europe in there, and then you add uh, other interests, other cultures, um, and it doesn't work as well. So he definitely sees that. He definitely touches on that. Um, and uh, But he does seem to go back and forth. And you know what? Because of where I come from, because of having been born in Romania with, with quite the love for the European Union for the longest time, I understand where he's coming from. There is a, a desire in every human heart and even intellect to, to see people collaborate and work together. But you know, then as you as, as I grow up and uh, as I, I look deeper into it, it didn't really seem that the EU was delivering what it had promised or what it had thought that it could deliver. Um, so that's just something that I think even he went a little bit back and forth on, and uh, and I can absolutely understand where he comes from, where he's coming from with that. Um, yeah, so the, the prospect of international order as we see it today is not an efficient. It's just not something that works and that functions. Um, if you're going to have a world federation, you're going to have to do it by force. And then the question becomes, where do you run to? I was born in communism. I could have run to a democratic country. But what can I do if the whole world follows the same ideology? Where do I run to? Of course, you could answer, well, Elon Musk is taking us to Mars, so maybe you can go there. But who knows? I mean... <laughs> Um, I may not have the money to go to Mars. <laughs> so, you know, the question becomes, are we talking about international order or is that international order going to lead to dictatorship? And, and I think he also agreed in, in many of his other writings that, um, and he even says that in here, I think it's on the last page, that this could be even more dangerous than war, if not done correctly. For me, in my view, it cannot be done correctly because of the reality of human nature. And as we know, we, everybody probably knows the quote, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. You cannot give an organization the power over so much and expect it to just sit there um, and only do the right thing. And the best example of that is the United States. The United States experiment started off beautifully, incredible constitution, uh, amazing founding fathers who had amazing ideas and over time it has been eroding more and more and more and we're not speaking from a historical perspective of a very long time in fact it's only a hiccup on the historical map of the world and it's already eroding dangerously so i think that the united states is a great example of what can happen uh, with with such a concept so on that note, I think I didn't go over and I didn't really go under very much with my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing, hopefully, and then see if I can see your faces. There you go. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much, Georgiana, for your great insights and views of the um, Road to Serfdom book and especially chapter 15. A uh, great presentation. Thank you very much.